snakes in the desert. Back in the good old days, some of you per perhaps remember when oranges grew up on Summersby or Pete's Ridge or cows were milked down here on the uh, Arimba Flats. Back in the good old days, there was a family, in fact, lots of families lived out in this area, and they didn't have any medical facilities. There, in fact, there was no town around the place, but there were a couple of ladies that would go out and visit the community, and they knew how to minister to most people's health. They had with them, they had Epsom salts, they had Condi's crystals, they had liniment, cod liver oil, red paint, remember mercurochrome? Rawleys and Watkins. So they were fully fledged. They were able to go out and look after most of the people. One day they went to one home and there was an old man and he was so sick. He was really crook. And they could see it was too big a job for them. He'd have to go to the city. He'd have to go a long way away. Now back up in the, in the rural area where they lived, the cream truck would come around oh, a couple of times a week. It would pick up the cream. Uh, it stunk like you know, but who worried? They only made butter and sent it to England. So to get to town, they said to the old man, you'll have to go on the cream truck. And when you get to town, you'll have to get on the train and you'll have to go to the city. Well, they gave him that many instructions. He would know when he was at the city because when he got there, something's not working. Can you flick it for me, Jack Black? There you are. When they got to the city... Um, they'd know because the place was just littered with 44-gallon drums. Get off at that station, you go up, and you go up to, to the Bank of New South Wales. Then you cross the road to the bakery, and when you go down a little bit, just a little bit further, that's where the, where the medical centre is, but just because we haven't been to town, it doesn't mean the town hasn't grown. They have a set of lights there now for the traffic. So when you come down to that spot, you'll see the lights. When you get there, if the lights are red, don't you go near them because the trucks will run over you and the fattest part of you will be your fingernails. You know, you be careful. Well, they gave all these instructions and dad was ready to go, but mum wouldn't let him go on his own. Oh, she'd have to go too. And so they got to town. They found everything, as everybody said, and they were going down. And, oh, there's the lights, green. And they were going flat out to get to the lights, waddling along. They got down near the lights and sure enough, they turned amber and then they went red. Well, when they got there, a whole group of people, young people, kids, gathered around them and they were like watching the tennis. They were looking this way and looking this way and looking this way. Looking. They were looking for a break in the traffic. They weren't going to obey traffic rules. And they looked there and all of a sudden, all these kids took off to rush across the street. There was a break in the traffic. And of course, Dad took off after them. He stepped out there flat out and Mum grabbed him by the braces. Dad, Dad, stop, 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 Dad, stop. Look at the light. Mum, come on, quick, look at the people. Who do you, who do I, or where do we get our marching orders? From looking at the people or looking at the light? What about when the chips are down, when there's a financial crisis and the pension doesn't come through? Look to the light or do we look to the people? You see, it was Jesus that said, I am. What am I doing wrong? Yes, I know what. I haven't turned it on. He that never made a mistake never made anything. Did you hear that? Well, I've made my first one. Jesus it was that said, I am the light of the way. I am the way. In fact, Peter went further. Remember cowardly Peter who was afraid of that little girl and afraid of those people who crucified Jesus? Six weeks later, he stood up in front of the very same people and said, there is no other name. There's no other way. He was very confident because he had come face to face with the light. He had seen the light. Well, I want to go to a couple of Bible stories this morning. I want to have a look at somebody that saw the light, that somebody that got a quick glimpse early in his life. And we'll go to the book of um, Luke, Luke chapter 10. 
You know the story there at the start of Luke chapter 10, little fellow, suffering little man syndrome, had never seen Jesus, had heard lots of stories about him. He decided he'd run down the road quickly, climb up a tree, and he would get a panoramic view. All right? He did. And Jesus walked down, stopped right underneath him, and said, Zach, come down here. Zach, I'm going to your place. We're going to dine together. We're going to socialize a little bit. And you know, I'm very interested in what Jesus said in there in verse 10. He said to Zacchaeus, he said, Zach, today, when? When? Today. When? Today. Today, salvation has come to this house. Somebody far wiser than me has said, if we could bring this realization to the world, what a different world or different community we would have. Today, salvation has come to this house. It made a tremendous difference immediately on Zacchaeus. Zac was an ordinary bloke. He got what he could and he canned what he got. But now he went out from there prepared to share to prepare to give, to prepare to be involved. So if I said to you today, salvation has come to this house, would you believe me? Would you accept it? Is it true? Is it that simple that accepting Jesus merits salvation now? Is it that easy? I want to give you a little test then. If we're going home from church today, after we've had soup and buns, and you were hit by a vehicle like that lady standing the other day with her husband by that cement truck, if you were hit by a vehicle and life was snuffed out, where would you spend eternity? Do you know? Does God want us to know? Should we know? And how would you get there? Now, I remember in my younger ministry, I made a stack of mistakes, so don't worry about that. But I asked that question to a dear old saint. And she got quite angry, like a little fox terrier. That's a stupid question. You shouldn't ask that question. Well, I was dumbfounded. And then she said, you know very well, probation hasn't closed yet. Whew. I said, sweetheart. I think it was the first time she'd ever been called sweetheart. <laughs> sweetheart, I said, if you're dead, I think probation's closed. Well, she said we shouldn't say we're saved. You see, I don't think she wanted to face that question because I don't think she had a clue where she would be if life was snuffed out now. I remember another time Hazel mentioned something about going to Fiji with that story. We were out in Fiji. In fact, by the way, any of you know a bloke, a fairly old fellow now by the name of Warwick Stokes? Well, he was there when I was there, so it's going back a while, isn't it, Warwick? <laughs> we were living down in a little rural area. We were by the coast. And back behind us, there was a big flat area and some Indians were running a dairy farm. Well, one day, someone from up at, that, up at that farm came racing down, yelling, Narayan Singh has had a heart attack. Narayan Singh has had a heart attack. Narayan. And fortunately, he had to run past our house. Now, we are medical professionals. We have in our house a book about that thick called Modern Medical Counselor, written in 1842. <laughs> Great old book. And as he ran past, my wife made a beeline for that book and turned over to the back page of Flat Out Index, Heart attack, heart attack. Keep the patient warm, keep the patient cool, keep the patient calm. Oh, we were specialists. <laughs> I had to go racing past that place, past our house to get up to where this farm was. And I went past and Hazel said to me, she had a box with a blanket in it and something else. Keep the patient calm, keep the patient cool. Keep the... Oh, okay. Well, I went back up there. I said, you ring the doctor quick and you go and pick him up because you know what will happen. And so she raced off in the vehicle one way and I went back up to this poor old man. And I got there. And they had him out in front of the window. 
And here they were fanning him with a great big cardboard box. He was freezing cold. The death dew was on his brow. I threw my arms around him and threw a blanket around him and pulled that thing away and sat down and just held Narayan's hand. Narayan, I've sent for the doctor. Narayan, the doctor's coming. Narayan, just relax. You know, just let's... I didn't know what else to say. And I had no idea what to do. Well, the doctor got there, and I was glad of that. But two minutes later, Narayan died. I was sad. But I have never seen the hopelessness of people in death as we see in perhaps pagan religions. The absolute hopelessness. The wife wanted to go in the Ryan right now. She, she was trying to get away. But I saw the pundit the day or so later. By the way, you have funerals on the same day. I saw the pundit, the priest, the day or so later, and he said to me, did you pray for Narayan Singh and Narayan's uh, soul when he died? I said, Bagodi. I said, I didn't stop praying while he was alive. I said, all the time. But I said, when he's dead, it's too late. Oh, and he went into all sorts of cantations because now he had to do things to deliver the soul from there to Nirvana. What am I saying? inherently within us, we automatically think we've got to do something to earn salvation. Don't we? Humanity. We automatically think that we've got to do something. You see, I think that's the reason Jesus took this story up with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house. Does that sound like good news? Come on, does it sound like good news? Zach, today you are free. Jesus has set you free. So I'd ask you again, if life was snuffed out, where would we spend eternity? You see, Jesus knew this again. I'm going back to the Old Testament now. He wanted to give a demonstration, an object lesson to his people for all time. And as they were coming out from the land of Egypt, they were coming up toward the promised land. And when they were coming up near to the promised land, they came to a place of red. And listen, look at these verses. Numbers chapter 21. Numbers 21, verses 1, 2, and 3. When the Canaanite king of Arad heard the Israelites were coming, he marshaled his army and captured many of them. Israel vowed a vow to God. If he would deliver these people into their hands, they would destroy the cities. God heard their prayer, united their families, and the cities were destroyed, and the place was called Hormah. Hey, I just want to take you on a journey for a moment, because I think these people must be the happiest people in all the world. Here they cry to God for help, and He helps them. Every night they had light for the way. They had pillar of uh, what cloud by day and fire by night. They were delivered from slavery. They had fresh food, water on tap. Shade from the sun, families were restored. Can you see why I'm saying they're happy people? Would you be happy? Come on, would you be happy? Do you think these were happy people? Well, why are you saying, what else have I got to do to make you happy? You get the story? I want to go on now and just read the next two verses to see how happy these people really were. Because who had done all this for them? Who had done it for them? Jesus was their light. Jesus was their bread. Jesus was their rock. He had been with them and he had done all for them that was possible to do. He had delivered them and they were his delivered, redeemed, saved people. So have a look at verses 4 and 5. Have a look at this happy group. Israel then set out to go by way of the Red Sea around Edom. And the people became what? <laughs> look at it. I'm glad that Gosford doesn't have these problems. <laughs> the people became impatient. The people became discouraged. The people became critical. 
because of the journey. And the people complained against Moses. They complained against God. Why have you brought us out here to die in the wilderness? We have no water and we hate this stupid food. Can you hear them? Impatience. Impatience. Look, I'd love to take some time and tell you a few stories about impatience, but I think just to cut it short, I'll say our prisons are full of them, full of impatient people, and every one of them is innocent. You go and ask them. Somebody else is wrong. Impatience, impatience, angry, complaining, impatience, discouraged, discouraged. They were discouraged. I think this is one that we can even have a look at here in church. You know this church far better than I do. Poke your eyes around for a moment and just see, is anyone missing from our church today? Now, why do I say you know? Because we generally sit in the same seats, don't we? So have a look at the seat and see who's missing. And if someone is missing, maybe it's discouragement. Maybe. Forget about the choir being away today in the singing group. We'll look after them too. But just think, is there somebody missing that I could contact, that I could encourage? Because discouragement can steal our salvation, can take us right away from the family and from our God. Critical, critical. We don't want God. We don't want Moses. We don't want this food. They concentrated on the negative. You know, they'd been out there in the wilderness. In fact, they stayed out there for years because of their complaining and their, their thoughts. And there was no feeble among them. Their clothes didn't wear out. But they forgot that. They forgot that. Critical criticism. We forget it. I wonder. I look down there and I see one or two that come from higher office. Ever hear anyone criticize the division? We wouldn't do it, Rod. We wouldn't do it. Ever hear anyone criticize the con Avondale? Where's Avondale? I heard someone from Avondale. Anyone ever criticize Avondale? You see, some of these complaints that came up and raised their ugly heads back there haven't died yet, have they? Same things, raise their ugly heads time and time again. You know, there's an economy of wording in this Bible, and it just says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. True or false? For all have sinned and continue. You see, every one of us are the same and we can fall into the same trap as they did three and a half thousand years ago. Criticism, discouragement, impatience. Have a look here. I think I might have them on the next one. Verses six and seven. I don't like this verse because it says fiery serpents came out and bit the people and many of them died. In fact, if you have an old KJV, it will say, and God sent the serpents. I don't like that. Do you? They cried to Moses, we have sinned. They confessed, we have sinned and spoken against you and God. Please intercede for us that God will take the serpents away. And Moses did as he was requested. God said, God said. But before we go there, I'd just like to think of this for a moment. Because here there were snakes and people had been bitten by snakes. Many of them had died from snake bite. And God says something fairly crazy to Moses. Go and make a bronze snake and put it on a pole that whoever looks at the snake will live. Now let's put ourselves in their, their position just for a moment. I've been bitten by a snake, poison rushing through the veins, and you say, look at a, look at a uh, snake. Crazy. Impossible. Couldn't happen. True? Couldn't happen. Listen, just let's remember that this is God's object lesson. It's not Moses' object lesson. And it's God's object lesson of salvation for his people, for the redeeming, the saving of his people. But if you were bitten, would you look at a stupid snake? Come on, would you? Because it says 
Moses said, anybody, everybody, mixed multitude, kids, women, anyone, look at the snake and you will live. Why a snake? The snake represents evil. The snake represents sin. The snake represents the devil. Is the devil going to save us? See the questions? You know, Paul gives us a tremendous answer, and I just love it. I love the answer, and I love the one who is the answer. Because Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that Jesus became sin for us. Good news or bad news? Jesus took my place. Jesus took my sin. Not in him, on him. And it crushed him. Jesus took my place. Well, let's go on quickly from here. Because I want to go to the New Testament. Because Nicodemus came to Jesus. And when Nicodemus came to Jesus one night, Nicodemus was a good Seventh-day Adventist, actually. He believed in heavenly geography. He believed in tithing. He believed in the Sabbath. He had lots of things going for him. But he didn't want people to see him coming to Jesus. And so he came at night time. And Jesus said to him, have a look in your Bible. Uh, John chapter 3, verses 14 to, to 18. Verse 14, Jesus starts off, Nick, just remember, Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Hey, where do you find that story? Well, we just looked at Numbers 21. Jesus is quoting the very same. Nick, listen. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever, that anyone, that everyone, whoever looks at him, will not perish, but have, a, have everlasting life. Good news or bad news? Come on, good news or bad news? Excellent news. Listen to it. P uh, Nick, Nicodemus, hang in there. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, anyone, that looks to him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, Nicodemus believed that his Sabbath keeping Nicodemus believed his 2,300 days. Nicodemus believed his tithing were all insurance policies for salvation. Did you notice Jesus? Whoever, anyone. Those things are all there that Nick believed, but they are the fruit of salvation. They are not the root of salvation. They're the fruit of a relationship. They don't breed the relationship. So let me come back to my original question. And by the way, I'm so thrilled to be here today and look at that clock up there because I will never be late. I'll never preach overtime. As I said, that, there's one over here, someone said, oh, well, don't look at it. Have you come to the position in your life that if life was snuffed out, that you know where you would spend eternity? Friends, come to Jesus now. Believe his word now. Believe him now. And be sure, be confident of your standing with him. Be one of the whoever. If you still doubt, stop with John. Just one minute, I'll go one step further. First John 1 verses uh, 6 to 9, it says, If we walk in the light... He is the light. Then we have fellowship. We're friends with each other. We have fellowship with one another. If we say we have no sin, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. But if we confess, we become one of the whoever. If we confess, he is faithful. John 2, now are we the sons. Now are we the daughters of God. Do you believe it? Is it true? All right, if that's true, have a look at the next one. If you want some good news, 1 John 5. Listen, this is the contract. This is the testimony. God has, past tense, God has given us eternal life. This life is in the Son. He who has the Son has what? True or false? I just love to go to kindy Sabbath school. And I'll ask the little kindies. I'll say, kindies, tell me, who's going to go to heaven? And how many hands go up? Come on, how many hands go up? Every one of them. Now I come into the senior. Seniors, 
How many are going to be in heaven? Is every hand going up? Come on, whack them up. You're not proud. We are, we are thankful. We're delighted. What does it say? If you have the Son, you have life. Believe on the Son, you've got it. Do we believe it? Do we accept it? Dear Lord, I'd like to thank you. In these times that you reveal yourself of a God, as a God of salvation and a God of love, we come to you this time to confess our shortcomings. We believe that you gave Jesus to die and we accept that gift now as a personal saviour. Thank you for accepting us as your sons and daughters now. Thank you for the assurance that you have given and you have given us everlasting life. Amen.